Today we're going to talk about the topic of significance. Now, how is significance different than self-worth? Remember last time we talked about self-worth and he said self-worth was what? Your inherent value. Right, the best way to help you understand the difference, well, let me give you a definition. Significance has to do with carrying out the meaning of what God placed in our lives when he created us. In the dictionary it says significance is what is signified or intended to be expressed, the meaning of an object. It's the degree that the object meets the intended use or potential. Now let's take that Rembrandt paint painting again. We said last time that Rembrandt painting doesn't make any difference what we do with it. It still has a value. Or your wedding ring. I don't care if you run it over with a car. I can still take it to the jeweler and get some money for it, right? But if I take that Rembrandt painting, as I said last time, and hang it upside down and crooked in a burned out slum, how much value does it have as a picture for making that slum look wonderful? It doesn't do too much, does it? And so when you're dealing with people in self-worth, they're going to say, but how about sin? What does sin do? And unfortunately in this area we have a problem because even some of the top authors have not split out uh, self-worth from significance. And because of that you get a jumble of what they say. As an example, Adams makes what I think is a mistake and he makes a statement and he says that uh, significance is what is signified uh, and he's talking about, uh, no, he says self-worth is uh, uh, based on what the person actually does. Do you see what I'm saying? And once you do that, you now have these two things totally jumbled and totally mixed up. But we said self-worth was your inherent value. It doesn't ever change. It is not based on how you perform. It is not based on what people think about you. It is not even based on your morals. It's based on what? The love of God. Just like a parent loves their kid, that's what it's all about. But now we're going to take up this other topic and see what the Bible tells us about this particular subject. And we're going to find out that just like in the area of self-worth, we have the same problem that the world has a system and the world's system is wrong. It's that simple. Because what is it? Now each society has sort of its own thrust, its own way that it looks at stuff, the, own, the thing that it emphasizes. Up until about 1957 here in America, the emphasis in our culture was on character that we were supposed to maintain character no matter what. If you read the old self-help books from the 20s or the 30s or the 1800s or whatever, you know, what are the stories like? You know, this person maintained their character no matter what. Since about 1957, a study showed that we are now more interested in success. Think of some other countries. Think of the Orient as an example. What is their thing? Yeah, it's saving face. That they are going to look good, and if you can't save face, you commit hairy care. You jump off a building because that is more honorable in their sight than it is to make a mistake or do something wrong. How about the Middle East? I believe the Middle East is revenge. See, to get you, they'll kill themselves. But here in America, it is significance or success would probably be a better term. And we're going to look at that and see how that all looks. <coughs> success works out here too in a little bit. But let's get a hold of the world system here in America, how we're looking at things in Europe. 
and see what we basically say. This is what leads to the rat race. See, I want to be somebody. I want to be important. See, in my own life, I believe that if I, I could just try hard enough, I could do anything. I was going to be somebody. And you can get clients over and over again, and probably every person, including Christians, fall into this particular trap. The first thing, what does it do to us? Let's see the effects of going out and trying to be somebody. Now, in the world, this is the idea. We're all here, and we're all in competition. Because it's called a zero-sum game. A zero-sum game means that if I get it, you don't get it. So if there's one promotion and there are two of us, who do you think I want to get promoted? How about me? I want the best of everything, so I end up playing this game, King of the Hill. Who's going to get to the top? It has all sorts of consequences for my life. That's what we're going to look at first. The first is, we're going to be stressed by our competitive lifestyle. Because there's always going to be somebody at almost as fast, or somebody a lot faster, and then how am I going to feel about myself? Well, my inherent worth should remain the same, but many times we get that all mixed up, and we take all this stuff, and we dump it along with self-worth, and now it really becomes a jump. But I have to run a little bit faster, don't I? How stressed do you think some people at the last Olympic Games were? Yeah, because you're going to either be there and you're going to get the gold or you're going to go home a loser. Only a limited few achieve significance at any time and it's short-lived. If I get to the top of, of the hill, playing king of the hill, what's going to happen? Everyone's going to try and knock me off. Eventually, all lose. And this is the bottom line to this whole worldly system. How do you like to play a game in which everybody loses? Well, that's this game. Think of it this way. Let's say you're a very good high jumper. And if you're the best high jumper, what's going to happen? If you're the best high jumper at your high school, you're going to go on the state, right? And if you're the best high jumper at state, what's going to happen? You're going to go to regionals. And if you're the best there, you're going to probably go to the Olympics. And what happens if you win the gold at the Olympics? No you won, right? But what do you have to do four years from now? You've got to do it again. And four years from then, do it again. What's eventually going to happen? You're only going to get a silver. You won't get a gold medal. You might not. You get so old, you can't even keep up with those young people. You know, and so on. And you're only going to get a silver. And guess what? What are you? A loser. Because you didn't get the gold. So what am I saying? Everybody eventually loses in life. In this game that we're playing. We are driven to take on more and more and finally take on more than we can easily accomplish. So like this, you're a small fish in a small fish bowl, right? Well, if you do good in the small fish bowl, what are we going to do? Promote you to a bigger fish bowl. In other words, if you're talented, if you do well, you're going to get promoted. And what's going to be about that next fish bowl? There are going to be bigger fish that can swim faster for you to compete with, right? What else is going to be in that bigger fish boat? Bigger sharks. And eventually, what's going to happen? You're going to get into a big enough fish boat where you can't handle the sharks and get your tail eaten off. And you see, you'll be stressed out and things get bigger and bigger. I don't care how talented you are. You know, sometimes I pity talented people. 
Because it just means they're going to get higher and they're going to... But the point is, the way it's made, everybody eventually reaches their limit of competition and capability, right? In society, or rather in the industry, it's called the Peter Principle. How many of you heard of that before? Long before I did this, I heard of the Peter Principle. Well, the Peter Principle says, eventually everyone will operate at their level of incompetence. What it means is just as we get promoted, I, if I do good on my job, what are they going to do? Promote me. When are they going to quit promoting me? Now, if I don't screw up really big, if I'm a good employee, they're not going to fire me. But what are they going to do when I no longer am performing, when I'm not the fair hairy boy, when I'm not doing everything that they want me to do it exactly right? What's going to happen? They're going to quit promoting me, right? Because what? Because I'm incompetent at that particular thing. And where am I going to remain for the rest of my career? Working at my incumbents. They're probably not going to demote me unless I really do bad, but I'm going to be there struggling, stressed out for the rest of the time until I finally retire. It's all something like fun. <coughs> now the system just has its... We're going to be driven to medicate our stress with addictions, alcohol, and drugs. What do you do when you're totally stressed out? When you've been working 12-hour days for the last year? One job I went to, they had one day off in the last year. They had numerous divorces. All sorts of stuff had gone on in that organization. But one day off in the last year. There are companies, and actually I get quite a few clients from one company here in town because what? And everything is competition. I mean, this is the epitome of what goes on. If you don't work weekends, you're going no place in that company. But it's stress, stress, and more stress. And eventually, you start doing something to cope. You start taking pills, or you start drinking on the weekends, or you start doing stuff to make life okay. To take care of your stress. We're taught to sacrifice character in order to accomplish things. I already mentioned that study. Anxiety becomes a major factor in our failures. There's something called the performance anxiety curve. So it looks like this. It goes like this, and it goes up. It's like a bell curve, and it goes down. What does it say? Initially, a little bit of stress, a little bit of competition and stuff will make you perform better. But eventually, when you cross the top of that, what happens? You perform worse and worse and worse and worse. And it becomes a snowball running downhill that you get worse in what you're doing. The more stressed out you get, the worse you perform. And the worse you perform, the more stressed out you get. So you perform worse, you get more stressed out. So you perform worse, you get more stressed out. There are a lot of people in our society that are so stressed with life, fear of failure is what we're talking about here, that they just go from job to job to job, stress out and leave. i tell you a true story. In the church that I had, I had two people that were without jobs. One of them didn't really speak much English. The Spanish guy spoke almost no English. And another guy who was uh, dealt with some mental illness type of problems that has a real bad problem in the area of significance of trying to be somebody. This is a guy who uh, went to take an IQ test every six months to prove he was smart because that was his family said he had to be to be worth somebody. And to be worth something and be significant. And this is the time of the census in 1990. So I told them both go down and get yourself a job with the census. Well, the one guy went in. <coughs> almost got in a fight with a lady at the door, by the way. But went in, sat down at the test, looked at the first two questions, threw up his hands, got up and walked out. Wow. I can't 
do this. I'm not significant. I can't handle this. This is too big for me. The other guy came in, flunked the test, and got up. <laughs> but this, it was the stress. At least he didn't walk out. He was the guy who didn't know very much English. He probably didn't even realize how tough the test was. <laughs> I'm sure he probably got hired because I need somebody to, in Spanish and so on. But still, the point to the thing was, because there was the fear of failure, he didn't stay there. He felt overstressed, felt he couldn't perform, and left. And in our society, we would call him what? A failure, right? But you see, you can set yourself up over and over and over again to lose. Let's look at another situation about how this affects us. Let's go back to the high jump scenario. If you have a person that has a problem in the area of significance, they feel they're unimportant, they can't do anything, or especially if they have a problem with self-worth, and they go for a high jump, the way it works is you get three jumps, and you get to choose where the bar is, right? The person that isn't struggling with this, what kind of a strategy would they use? Well, they would first set the bar fairly low where they know they can make it, right? And they would go and jump and make that fairly easily. Then the next time what they do? Raise the bar again where they think they can make it. And if they make that, what are they going to do? Raise it another time. They might miss that one. But at least they've made a jump in which they can succeed, right? How about a person that's struggling in this particular area? Especially if it's tied to their self-worth. Of course, we say it shouldn't be, but let's just say it is. It usually is. What do they do? Well, they can't be a loser. So they have to show everybody, don't they? They have to be somebody. So what do they do? They set the bar at the record. And they miss it. So what do they have to do next? They can't look like a loser since they set a bar a notch higher. And they eventually don't make anything at all. In the Olympics, there's a true story of this particular man, and this is in the uh, aerial snowboarding. This is the Winter Olympics. And he had won the gold medal for years. And this guy was so much into this that during the summer, he would actually do this and fall in the swimming pool. Because what they do is they, on a snowboard, they hit this hill, shoot straight in the air, and see how many flips and how many things they can do before they come down, they have to land back on the snowboard. And a young kid, and we're talking about how you all lose eventually, well, a young kid did one more flip and one more twist in the air than had ever been done in the history of the world. And this last guy who had won the gold every time comes up. What does he have to do? You see, he can't lose, can he? So he hits the board really hard, goes up, gets higher, does all this kind of stuff, but hit it so hard that he falls on the way down and leaves the Olympics with nothing. But you see, he couldn't just be. He couldn't just say, well, that's just too much, you know, and so on. I can't do that. I've never been able to do that before. I'm not going to take a chance. I'll just walk away with the silver. Or he would be a loser. But now what is he? In the world's eyes, he's a real loser. He didn't even get a medal in the Olympics. You see the effects that this whole method has on you and how it messes up your life? We are losing our soul for the sake of success in the world. Why? How many people, in order to get to the top of the corporate ladder, did so much work that they lost their family? Or they're so consumed with this that they don't have a life? The company owns them. They don't have a balance in their life. Well, those are the effects of the world system. The bottom line is what? All lose. In some fashion, in some way, the world system of significance is all lose. 
Now let's look at God's system. You know what your rule is? All win. Which system do you think you would rather have? For some reason, I think that God's system might be a little bit better, and he might know what he's doing, but let's see what it really says. When the Bible speaks of significance, it generally uses the term worthy as an evaluation of merit, as it is compared to God's original intention for us. The ultimate in human function is called the glory of God. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 2.12. That you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Philippians 1.11. Being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by, Christ, uh, are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and the praise of God. Talking about glory, we're talking about something wonderful. And of course, God has that perfection and so on. But God has a plan and he wants you to be somebody. But let's look at it further. Everything we do in our own strength that is motivated to selfishness is, therefore, filthy rags in the eyes of God. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. What are we saying? Go back now in the class when we talked about salvation and we talked about this thing called selfishness. Remember what we said about it? We said it's trying to meet the needs of the self, the need for what? Self-worth, for significance, for love and for security. And, so what does that say about all of my attempts if I try to be somebody, if I try to make myself important, how does God look at that? Worthless. Because you did it for yourself. He's looking for love. Things done out of love. For your concern for the other people. No, you did it. You were nice to that person. Because he wanted to look good. You were nice to that person because if you were nice to them, then they would take care of you and it would help you get one notch higher in your ladder of significance. See, there are people that are very well socialized and they play this rat race very nicely. And you like them. But why are they doing it? The Bible says anything you do out of selfishness, any, any attempt you have to make yourself significant, See, what do most people do in this area? They go out and they work really hard. Or they go out and they do things. Now, there are other people that go out and sell crap to make them get money to make themselves more significant. But whatever you do, whether it's because you're a good person doing what you're supposed to do because that's what you ought to do, God rejects it. Because you're doing it out of selfishness. It's wrongly motivated. As our faith grows, we are transformed more and more into the full, into our full potential. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. For moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called, and whom he called, then he also justified, and whom he justified, then he also, what? Glorified. So through this process of faith that we call salvation, remember? That is how we're supposed to become significant in life. Not through what we do, but through what God has already done for us. Remember what we said? No matter what you do in this life, remember the analogy, how significant and important is it? When we compare your accomplishments and what you can do here to the known universe. Remember, we can put off almost a million of our, more than a million of our Earths inside of our sun. We can travel at the speed of light. Uh, and even if we blew our entire solar system up, it would be like one grain of sand of all the sand of all the seashores in the entire world. So how significant is all this stuff and all of your attempts to make yourself significant? 
But what if the God of the universe says, I've chosen you to be my son or my daughter. I have chosen you to be on the team that's going to rule the universe. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And I've got a throne already prepared for you in heaven. How significant does that make you? I'm suggesting way beyond anything you can ever do in your own efforts and no matter whether you win the rat race or not of life, which you can't win, you can't make yourself any more significant than you already are by what Jesus Christ has done. So do you see it's all by faith. If I don't have faith, I'm not going to get delivered from my selfishness and everything I do is going to be rejected. Let's continue to see this. Jesus resolved the problem of shame for us when he took our shame upon him and died upon the cross. Even with all that Christ has done for us, the Bible tells us that we are still powerless to do anything of merit if we don't do it in his, own, in his power. John 15, 4. Abide in me and I in you, for the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. So what am I saying? You can't do anything in yourself by your own efforts to solve this problem. The Bible makes it clear that we cannot do anything. Just what I'm saying. In our own efforts, that's called the law. To make ourselves into better people and more significant. Let's look at Galatians here. Uh, verse 2. This only I would learn of you. Receive you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, that you would be made perfect by the flesh? Perfect means what? Again, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, to come into that glory, to be what God wants of you. It says right here, you can't do it. So why are you trying so hard? How come your little rat is running around in little circles and running your little uh, treadmill so, so fast? You can't do it in your own strength and your own effort. It is God that makes us want to do what is right, promotes us, and assists us in being successful and wealthy. Even if you feel you have accomplished something, what do you need to know? You didn't do it. God was working behind the scenes. I've got one client I'm working with. He's very judgmental. Why is he very judgmental? He thinks he did it. He came from a dysfunctional family. He pulled himself up in his bootstraps and he's the only one that is successful in life. And therefore, he has no compassion. And he's very judgmental of other people because they should have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps too, right? No, you can't do it. He just doesn't realize that all his accomplishments are filthy right. Philippians 2.13 for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. It says in, uh, in Psalm 75, it says that promotion cometh not from the east, nor the west, nor the south. Promotion cometh from God. He sets up one and puts down another. If we think we can accomplish anything and take credit for it, we've fallen into the trap of pride. And the Bible says, what about pride? Pride comes before the fall. When God adopted us into his family, we became so important by that fact that we cannot become any more significant in our own efforts. That's what I already said. We must therefore draw the conclusion that our significance is totally dependent on what Christ did and that we cannot do anything in our own strength to achieve any greater success than this by ourselves. But does that mean you can't Ever be significant? No means you already are so significant you can't get any more significant. But how about the subject of success? Does it mean you can't be successful in life? Well, let's see how God defines success. And let's see how, again, this whole thing works from God's point of view. Now, what's success? Success, I'm going to tell you, is simply fulfilling the plan of God in your life. 
The Bible tells us that God has a plan for every, uh, for us even before we were born and that he designed us to fulfill that plan. Because each of us has been designed and called for a specific purpose, we are not to be in competition with others, but with ourselves to become all that God has called us to do. Consider the situation. See, the world says that we're all in the same ranks, right? God says none of us are in the same race. Everybody in this room is unique and has your particular call of God on your life for a specific thing. It's sort of like we're all in this race and one of you is running the 50-yard dash and I'm running the 440 and another one of you is running the marathon. And we all get ready and we get down the chocks and ready to go and the gun fires. What happens if I look at the person that's running the 50-yard dash next to me? What's going to happen? What if I compare myself with that person? Well, what if I try to keep up with them? And then they stop at 50 yards and I gotta run 440. I'm gonna die. But what if I compare myself to the person on my right who's running the marathon? I'm gonna think I'm doing great. I'm gonna say, man, what a loser. He didn't even get down the chops. He's barely running. Do you see the problem? The Bible says they that compare themselves one with another are not wise. Because you aren't running the same race I'm running. I'm not in competition with you. You're not even in competition with somebody else in this class for a grade. Because you're supposed to be doing everything as unto God and you're supposed to be simply fulfilling His call in your life, right? If you compare yourself one with another, you're going to mess up your race. God has also chosen to give us different talents based on our calling, and He will reward us for what we do with them. Matthew 25, 15. And unto one He gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. How many of you, before you were born, went to God and said, I want to be a five-talent man? You mean you didn't get to choose? How many talents you have? Well, in the world, that's how we evaluate people, isn't it? Very talented people, they're significant, they're up here, right? Well, if you didn't get to choose, how can we blame you? We can't, but more than that, let me ask you a question. Why did God give one person five talents and another person two talents? Realizing that day this was an amount of money, today that's your capabilities. And another person one talent. Isn't he jipping the one talent person? Isn't this totally unfair? Let me ask you a question. What if God took a person and his mission in life is to be a trash collector? And he gave him the brain of Einstein. Would he make a good trash collector? I think he'd be sitting on the side of the road reading all the papers he picked up. <laughs> Figuring out all these formulas in his head and he'd be totally miserable, right? So do you see, God gives you a particular mission and he gives you the talents for that particular mission. But how about this whole competition thing? I mean, isn't the five-talent man at an advantage over the one-talent man? Let's look at what the Bible says. Let's jump down in uh, Matthew 25. Matthew, to 9, verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth unto them. And so he that received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Thou deliverest unto me five talents, behold, I have gained beside thee five talents more. And the Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now we expect that, right? That's the way the world system is too. 
the one who gets five and he makes five, man, he's the one he made president or whatever, and he is really significant in life, right? But now jump down a little bit. Verse 22. He also that had two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me the two talents. Behold, I gained two other talents beside them. This guy did perform the same as the other guy. He only made two talents. The other guy made five talents. And what did the Lord say to him? And the Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. He said exactly the same thing to the guy who made two talents as the guy who made five talents. Why? Because the guy had a different mission, but also because God gave him the two talents and God only <coughs> expects you to do with what he gave you. And he that received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast sown and gathering where thou hast not brought, and I was afraid. You see, he bought into the world system. He said, I'm not a five-talent man. I quit. What if the one-talent man had made one talent? What were the master said to him? Well done. well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you know what? That one-talent man is just as successful as the five-talent man. Because he fulfilled his mission, his mission happened to be a one-talent mission. See what I'm saying? What else does it say? The Lord always says to them, Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. So whatever God gives you, if you use it to that level, He gives you more. What did He say to the one telling man? And the Lord answered and said, Thou wicked and slothful servant, Thou knewest that I reap where I sow not and gather where I have not strong. Thou ought therefore put my money into the exchangers, and then I could have come with my and received my own with usury. Saying you need to use it, and he expects something of us, but he expects more of the five talent person than he expects of the two talent person than he expects of the one talent person. What am I saying? If you're just a one talent person. It's not just because that's what you're supposed to be, right? Mm -hmm. Then use your one talent for the glory of God and you'll get the same reward as the guy who was a five-talent person. And God will even give you another talent. And you'll keep working and you can do more. But everybody wins. Do you see that? One pastor put it this way. I was no good to God until I realized God hadn't called me to be somebody great. One of the things you really have to work with your clients is get them to accept themselves like they are and use what they have because they're just as successful. The Bible also says that in the last days many that are in this world seem to be great will be least. See, I believe it's possible that the greatest in the kingdom of God is a Down syndrome child who gave one tract to one person. Because God takes into account. The Bible also says we'll be judged by the amount of light we have. We're judged by the amount of talents that we have. So who are the worst off people in this world? Very talented people. Because more is going to be expected of them, right? But not really, because see, God gives you the right number of talents for what your calling is. He prepares you and provides what you need. God has specifically placed persons of different talents in each of his churches. He wants a whole church. Somebody needs to be the pastor, but does that mean everybody should try and be the pastor so they can look good and be significant in the church? Is the pastor really more significant than the other people in the church? Absolutely not. The pastor might be much less significant because he's got all these talents and he's supposed to be using them. He's not doing a good job with them. And the janitor, who has one talent, is doing a wonderful job keeping the church clean. And the God, that janitor, is more significant than the pastor is. 
Because he's doing what he was called to do. Those things that are motivated by selfishness and those done in the flesh according to what we want to do will have no value and will be rejected by God. Let me prove it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. <coughs> For other foundation can no man lay than which was laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon the foundation gold, silver, or precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Is this something that is done by the power of God, by the motivation of love? Or is this something you built this huge kingdom and you built this whole church of 50,000 people by your own efforts to make yourself look good? What's going to happen? Your own works, the stuff you did out of your own motivation, selfishness, not relying on God, is going to be burned up. If any man works abide, abide, which he shall build therein, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer a loss. But he himself shall be saved as though by fire. What's it say? This isn't a matter of salvation. This is a matter of reward. It's a matter of carrying out your mission. It's a matter of significance in the kingdom of God. In God's system, we can all win and be successful in life. But you see, you can't compare yourself to each other. Do you see what it's saying? Now let's look at a model of this and see how clear this whole thing is. Okay? See, the Bible warns us in Matthew 22, 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. What does that mean? It's really saying everybody has a call of some sort on their life, but how many of them really end up fulfilling that call? What happens to us? Why don't we end up fulfilling that call? We get diverted into the things of the world, into the things that we think make us significant, like money or jobs or promotions or uh, reaching the top of the corporate ladder or having a nice house. And we get diverted from what God really called us to do. Let me make a comment. How, how about knowing what you're called to do? Well, the first thing you're called to do when you get saved, we call it general call. The general call means you're there to witness to people, to support your church, to support your pastor, do whatever needs to be done. Once you prove yourself faithful in that, then God will eventually reveal your specific call as you prepare yourself. It says in Luke as it is, uh, chapter 45, it says that servant which knew not his master's will and did it not will be beaten with few stripes. But that which knew his master's will and did not prepare himself will be beaten with many stripes. So God's serious about this sin. Let's look at the story of John the Baptist. See, John the Baptist, even from a kid, had a call in his life. Look at Luke 1, 13. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall turn, shall he turn to the Lord their God. So that is John the Baptist's call, right? Now let's look at it first from the world's situation, then we'll go back and look at how God looks at the whole thing. We don't know of anything about John the Baptist for the first 30 years of his life. Besides that, he got born. And then, what do we see John the Baptist doing? We see him in the desert. Eating, yeah. This is the way it really sounds significant to you. Eating grasshoppers, basically locusts, but the same as the grasshopper. And wild honey. And wearing grody camel's hair. And screaming at people they need to be saved and they need to be repent because they're a bunch of blasted low-life sinners. And from the world's standpoint, he 
preach for about six months. And because he wasn't politically savvy, he said something about the ruler, King Herod. He said, you shouldn't be married to your brother's wife. And he got his head shot. Now, from the world's point of view, how significant was John the Baptist? Loser. Bad loser. I mean, he totally blew it. I mean, he never got in the corporate ladder. He never had gold. He never made anything of himself. He never went to school. I didn't even know if John the Baptist could read. But what did Jesus say about John the Baptist? So skip to the end here and let's see, and then I'm going to come back and let's look at what he really did. Okay? Matthew 11, 11. Verily I say unto you that among those born of woman there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist, a greater, that means before this time, was as great as Moses, as great as Elijah, as great as Abraham. No one was greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because John the Baptist figured out what he was called to do here on earth. And he carried it out. And he got out of the way. Let's see what John the Baptist did. This is a model of what it takes to be really successful in the kingdom of God. First, you need to find out what you're called. He was already told, his dad was already told when he was born what he was called to do. We must accept that we are already significant because of who we are in Christ, reject the world system of trying to establish our own significance through worldly accomplishments, and be willing to accept what God has called us to do, even if it appears worthless in the eyes of the world. How many of you, if you found out that God really called you to be the janitor of your church for the rest of your life, could accept that and not try to be something different and do a good job and keep that church beautiful and wonderful and feel significant in life? That'd be a challenge, wouldn't it? But that's what God is calling you to do. Think of it this way. In the army, in Iraq, what do you think people want to do and be? Probably want to fly the airplanes, or drive the tanks, or be the, the, the biggest, most sophisticated weapons system you can get your hands on, right? Because that's who the glory is, right? See, do you want to be the pilot or do you want to be the crew chief who keeps the, air, the plane maintained? Most of us would want to be the pilot, right? But what if you go out there and you're the crew chief and this actually happened and you took the plane and you flew it? What are they going to do? Court-martial you. Because you're not doing what you are called to do. And if you're not doing what God called you to do in the kingdom of God, God may court martial. You know there are people overseas that are trying to be missionaries who were never called to be missionaries that are just doing the wrong thing and keeping somebody else from being in that slot to be a missionary. See, you work against the kingdom of God. You see what I'm saying? When you don't accept your place that God has created you for, and how frustrated are you going to be? Out of your mind. Because the only way you're going to find peace is when you find the center of God's will, and you do that, and you don't try and make yourself into somebody you're not. You know what happens when you try and make yourself into somebody you're not? You get to be a small fish in a big fish bowl with big sharks. <laughs> <laughs> and you stress yourself out and you're miserable in life and you say, God, life is too hard. I'm overwhelmed. The God says, no, it's not. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. What's the problem? 
You added all that extra stuff into your life to make your life stressed out and make yourself hard and you're trying to make yourself into somebody that never God never created you to be. You have to find out what you were, what God created you to be and accept that. I used to try to make things happen. I learned, no, let's find out what God's doing and let's go along what He's doing. And I'll tell you what, it's a whole lot easier. We must obey God and do what He tells us, even if we feel unworthy. It seems overwhelming or it seems insignificant to us. See, John obeyed God and baptized Jesus. In Matthew 3.14 it says, And John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me. This when Jesus said, I want you to baptize me. He said, I'm unworthy to baptize you. I mean, God, see, there's the other half of this too. God may have called you to something far beyond you think you could ever accomplish and do. And so you don't, hey, God, you couldn't have called me for that. I know I can't do that, God. He says, great, now let's get started. Because I knew you couldn't do it. That's why I called you to do it. Because then you'll do it in my power and you'll do it in my strength. See, the truth is we all have to come to an end of ourselves. But we know we can't do things. Hey, the world system is really good for that. It'll help you run into concrete walls over and over and over again until you finally realize that you're trying to do what you're not supposed to be doing and you finally settle down and do what God designed you and called you to do in the first place. Because it won't work. We must not seek to make a name for ourselves or compete with others, but do the best to fulfill exactly what God has called us to do. John the Baptist did not try and make a name for himself. In fact, he said the opposite. In John 3.30, he says, He must increase, but I must decrease. He said, My mission is not to take over. What would have happened if John the Baptist had competed against Jesus? Would have it worked? No, he would have been frustrated and would, have been, would he be carrying out his mission? No, he was the forerunner of the Christ and he had to say, that's what I am. I'm the forerunner of the Christ. He, he said, I'm not even worthy to be a slave. He saw his position. Does that make him not significant? No, it makes him more significant because he knows where he is and what he's supposed to be doing. In the world, what do we call this? Being a team player. You notice what happens? Even the world knows that their system's messed up. See, what happened in the Olympics again to some of the American teams that had all these superstars on the teams? They lost. Because superstars, what? They have the big head. They have to be somebody. They have to be significant. And so they don't play necessarily well with each other. The ones that are truly superstars. But look at our society. How much money does a superstar athlete make? See, who do we reward? We reward the ones, the rats that get to the top of the hill. But we really need people that work together, and that's what God needs. We must be willing to sacrifice whatever it takes to fully fulfill our ministry and accept whatever God has for us in our life. John was condemned by the world and eventually executed in only six months of ministry. How many want to volunteer for that? But we don't hear him complaining. He was sort of challenged when he was in jail and so on. Really wondering, are you the Christ? The disciples came back and said, yes. See the miracle he's doing? See what's going on? But see, in God's eyes, by the way, how long is this life? A vapor that comes and passes away. But see, we all want to be important. We all are working. We all get tied into this world system. And we end up frustrated. And in truth, you can end up being truly insignificant in the kingdom of God because you never 
even fulfilled your calling. You never even attempted your calling. You said, God, I don't want to go to Africa. Or you said, God, I don't want to do that. I want to go over and do this other thing. It's a lot more fun. That's not being successful in the kingdom, kingdom of God. We must preserve, <clears throat> we must persevere in doing our life and what is important in this world from God's point of view, yield our lives for His glory and trust Him to bring it to pass. Now let's tie this all together. We've talked so far about self-worth and we've talked about significance. <coughs> And I want to tie it all together into one picture, sort of as we did. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden and talk about where these things are and how they happen in a person's life. First, in the Garden of Eden, how worthwhile were people? completely worthwhile because God made them in his image and he said they were very good and he loved them, right? After the fall and sin came into the world, how worthwhile are people? They're just as worthwhile as they were. It had nothing to do. The sin had nothing to do with their inherent worth. Now what happens to us though if you believe the lie that your worth is greater when you succeed and it's less when you fail. What happens to you? Emotional swings. If my life is going good, I'm happy and everything is wonderful and I am significant, right? But when I fail or I get fired, see, if you believe the lie that you get to be more worthwhile, then you have to believe the lie when things don't go right, you're a worm that should be stepped on. So you put yourself in an emotional roller coaster that messes up your life. The truth is, it doesn't change. The truth is, you are the same in self-worth all of your life and there's nothing you can do to change that. You just as well accept it. You're okay. And God loves you because you are that way. And God loves you and that's why you are that way. Now how about significance? In the garden, how significant were Adam and Eve? Before the fall, absolute significant, right? They were fulfilling the glory of God. Now when they ate of the tree of good and evil and they sinned, what happened? Their significance dropped down to nothing in selfishness. Okay, now, when we get saved, what happens? You might not think about it, but your significance goes all the way to the top because it's based on what? On what Jesus did, not what you did. How close is Jesus conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? <laughs> How about a hundred percent? And that's the glory of God. You see what I'm saying? Well, how about my sins? Well, they would make you less significant, you see what I'm saying? Except for what? Jesus paid the price for you on the cross, and your sins are forgiven, so they disappear. Now, how about, now we call that imparted, imputed righteousness. How about what happens in my life? To the degree I have faith in my life, to that degree, I'm transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And to that degree, I actually act out the significance that I have in my life. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm already significant. I'm already a child of God. I'm already so significant I can't get any more significant. But am I acting that way? No. What's going to change my acting? Faith. To the degree I really believe that's true, that's to the degree I'm really going to be okay. And I'm, if I already know, say, okay, God, I believe it. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go out there and try and make myself more significant. I'm going to say, God, what do you want me to do? 
And I'm going to go out and do it. And in truth, I'm going to now be acting out my significance. Do you see what I'm saying? And I'm actually going to get more and more useful in the kingdom of God by doing that. And I'm going to fulfill my calling. And I'm actually, from the point of view of the kingdom of God, become more and more and more significant. You see how it works? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your mercy and your grace. I thank you, Lord, that we be part of your system, not the world system. And instead of all of us losing, we can all win. And I ask you to help every person here to get a hold of what that is and to find their calling and to fulfill their calling and accept their significance that comes from you and eventually act out that significance in the name of Jesus.